Hello, my name is Joel Kirk. I'm the artistic director and founder of Discovering Broadway. Welcome to today's interview with Philippa Sue. Philippa Sue has originated three iconic roles, Eliza Schuyler in Hamilton, Amelie in Amelie, Natasha in Natasha Pierre in the Great Comet of 1812, and most recently she starred alongside Uma Thurman in the Broadway play, The Parisian Woman. Philippa, thank you so much for joining us here today. Oh my gosh, yes, my pleasure. Big reaching out. The people want to know what you're binge watching right now. Gosh, well, we just watched um, Tiger King. <laughs> what do you think Netflix. about that cast of characters? <laughs> you know, it's funny, like, some, sometimes I think, oh, gosh, that's too big of a character choice, just, like, way too big. And then I watch that, and I'm like, no. Like, people have very big characters. People are all the star of their own documentary, aren't they? Great. Yeah, social media has created a celebrity of everyone, or at least in their mind. Do you think Carol killed her husband? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> I totally think that. I, well, this was just an April Fool's joke, but my husband was just in a a little. They made a little like fake poster for Tiger King the Musical. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> you did shows like. Oklahoma in high school you were like Sarah in Guys and Dolls so what do you like remember a, a just like a first moment where you were like oh this is a lot of fun oh I gotta do this a lot oh I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life the first time that you get to be not just on stage performing because I had done dance recitals and I had done like piano recitals and singing recitals so I had performed before but like to be in a play where you're telling a story and the whole the whole group of people that you're working with, the goal is just to like get this story across, and we're all trying to make something greater than ourselves. Like it just like I was hooked. And not only that, but and it sounds a little silly, but like the really fun part for me was just like getting to know people, the backstage quirks, everything that was happening around making this thing, um, just felt really special. And so I just I craved that you know, from doing Bye Bye Birdie at the age of 12. And I just sought that in my school and in wherever I could audition and eventually ended up wanting to train and have that be a thing. Right. And then you went to Juilliard and you I were in group, group 41, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. So you would know my friends, Kai and Kim and Ishmania. Uh -huh. and yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm curious about the shows you did at Juilliard. You were in The World in the Moon, right? Yes, which is a very, it was a Carlo Galdoni, basically the whole concept was that we were doing this in mask and doing it sort of as a comedia show. Right, have you done much like mask comedia del work after Juilliard? Because I know you love that stuff and it's hard. I love it. It's really hard, but I found it when I was training, um, we did the like mask class in school and I just, the mask gives you permission to release because you've got this thing over your face and it's guiding you. And like, I just found it so freeing actually, even though there is a lot of, there's a lot of rules and a lot of specificity with how the masks are used. Um, I found that entirely freeing because I think I'm the type of person to get a little stuck in my brain. So when I got to like enter into a scene with my body being the first thing that I access, like, the rest of it sort of flowed very freely, and I just found it to be so invigorating. The clowning work that we did as well, you know, there's a little clown that has sort of appeared every once in a while, um, a little bit through Amelie, for sure, and then definitely to Macho, this Ethan Lipton play that we did downtown. Um, that was definitely, like, accessing that very clowny, physically specific part yes oh i wish i had seen the production downtown i saw the first one at the wild project when club mm -hmm. club first had it in its season yeah and i remember <laughs> looking at the cast which was exactly the high caliber of the cast you guys had and it, it was like july and i was like how are all these <laughs> how are all these people doing this like this is the best of theater in that like the set budget was nothing, but they made the most of ev like a stick and ev everything. But it, it yes. was what, like that was the world it was trying to be. So it was amazing. Um, it was great. It was a really fun process. And unfortunately we did end a week early because of uh, all of this 
craziness that has been happening. Right. Um, but it was definitely one of those experiences where we laid it all out every night. So I didn't feel like I was, you know, robbed of any experience once they were like, well, tonight's going to be your last night. Um, so I, I was like very pleased and the whole cast felt the same. We were like, yeah, we really did a good thing. So let's just have our last hurrah and then we'll call it a day <laughs> and go into our apartments and hoard toilet paper. Um, so you were at college when like a programming shift was kind of happening. Like you, I felt like you guys were just going in a whole new direction of new plays, new writers, and I'm sure as somebody who was doing like the Golden Age musicals, I know you were also like the leading player in Pippin, and uh, you were bringing these classics back to life. Whereas now you're jumping into Juilliard, you're you're doing an introspective on you as an actor in a way that you've never had to do before. But you're also looking at work as an unfinished product for the first time. What was yeah. that like? Uh, really amazing. I um, I think like many young actors of color. It's, uh, you know, you're constantly putting yourself in the stories of, that are mostly white because these musicals that you're doing are, were mostly done by white people and are, are um, you know, stories that I don't necessarily think like I re related with. But I was happy to exercise empathy and, and my acting skills and really try and put myself in these stories and these other people's shoes. And ultimately there were universal topics in these beautiful plays that I think we all gained from. But personally, I had never played an Asian woman, you know, at least until I was like in, in college, like throughout high school, I never played like a specifically written, a character written as an Asian woman. So um, that was interesting. So, so like getting into school and then and working on things that are new and shows that are that have not been written yet, um, you start to get into your culture and race comes into it because it's a new play and, and you're holding up a mirror to society and the way we see society has changed from the days when we were doing you know guys and dolls for the first time. So. Um, I felt like real love for new work and after graduating and having all these skills with working with new writers and getting to, to give your input and also at the same time just throw yourself into something completely new um, was a great skill set that I brought into working on Natasha Pierre. Right. Um, And I think found sort of like this very uh, specific niche of like, you know, classic stories told uh, through a modern day lens. Um, so really diverse casting and the concept and the design is very um, fantastical and hinting at the historical but very modern at the same time and so that sort of led to the the Hamilton road um which was a really wonderful road to go down so I feel like that all really like, to your question that all really started in school when I got to work on things and see what it's like to actually be developing something while also trying to put it on speed right because the, the muscles you use for new work, many of them are the same. You're trying to find out what the objective of the character is, what are the obstacles, make it real. But then there's these other muscles about how are you helping a playwright that doesn't maybe know what the play wants to be yet get right. there. And because it's, it's, some rooms are everyone is like trying to write the play with the playwright, and then some rooms are people trying to help the playwright find the play. Do, yeah. What What's the difference between those two? Because everyone who's worked with you says she's so amazing. She's down to play. She tries to, you know. But that's not that's not everybody, and that takes its own kind of gift and freedom, as you were saying with the mask work. Yeah. Well, I think you know when you're given a script, at least when I'm given a script, and um, you know, I I look at that as being like a roadmap. 
and there's sometimes very specific directions, sometimes there's not, but you have to sort of fill in the gaps and you have to try it before, like an, like anything, any play that you do before you um, can truly make a judgment on a scene and how it works, you really just have to like say it out loud, which is why these development processes happen. Right. There's a part of me that like I try and turn on my be inside of this brain so that when I'm working on something, I'm truly just like li- trying to live as a character and play out what is in front of me. And then there's also my other brain, which I can try and switch on, where it's about this outward sort of input. But I trust that, you know, if I'm working with the director and the writers in the room and we're doing the scene and I can feel it's like weird or not working, then it will be apparent. I have, I trust that will it will be apparent that it's not working. Right. But if I can sense that it's not working and and maybe I, I'm questioning whether or not I'm the only one who's seeing this, mm. well, I'll bring it up. You know, like the, I think the worst thing a writer could hear is like, I really think it should be this. I think like, <laughs> you know, I think questions are always great because, um, you know, if I if I ask a question about something that I feel is like strange. I could maybe find something out that I wouldn't know before. And then maybe the writer would be like, Oh, I needed to be more specific about how that was being delivered because right now it's just like an open playing field and she's delivering it like really kindly. And I actually need to do her to really do it like really fast and like really briskly. And so like that changes the storytelling as well. So like, I don't really in, in developing a new piece of, writing I like I never go into it thinking like this is what it's going to be like I you kind of have to be very flexible that it's going to change and sometimes you know when you're in performances it might change like that day so you've originated three pretty iconic Broadway musical roles you're still in your 20s oh yeah still so so now that you're retiring what will you do with the time (laughs) no you don't know you're originating an iconic role until after. Um, originating characters like Amelie, which are cultural icons, um, you, you've you also immortalized the Skyler sisters. <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. there were, that process of taking a writer's words, your own, like, spiritual essence as an actor, um, and marrying those things and, and finding these characters. Do you... Can you remember moments when, with all of these characters, where you're like, "Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm a symbol now. I've I've created a musical theater symbol that's never going to be forgotten." In the same way that you know you pull up Carol Channing doing "Hello Dolly" or or Ethel Merman. You know, ha- have you had that moment, or are you like, in, or do you not know that? <laughs> oh, it's funny that you say that because I think. Being certainly being in in these projects, I'm, that's not going through my mind at all. I think that that notion of you know my body of work, specifically these incredible shows that I've gotten to be in, are have like lasting effect, is a, a concept that I think I will continue to absorb. But I don't think it's something that has completely um, you know hit home. In, in, in a way, yet. yeah. Well, don't be I surprised. Cer- <laughs> I, I'm shocked. No, I'm, I'm certainly like I. You know what it is? It's like it's those interactions, honestly, with people who will like share a story about how it, um, you know, moved them or changed something about their lives or, you know, changed something about how they view the world. Um, it's those moments where like it's like it slowly drops in because I think that people are not very keen to change. I think a lot of people don't like change. Um, and it's a rare thing when a person can literally change their mind about something. Um, and it's very brave and very courageous and it takes a lot of vulnerability to do something like that. So when somebody says like, wow, you just really made me realize this, 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 you made me realize like women have been like lost in history. You made me realize like, what forgiveness truly means. Um, like, those are really powerful things. So, like, I, I find it in those moments. It's weird enough that my silhouette is 
on a wall in Times Square. Like, <laughs> and, you know what? what talk about like, that. Those, talk about that. I mean, those moments, I it doesn't even hit me. Like it hits my younger self. Like I, I think about like my younger version of me and like how crazy that would possibly like wouldn't even happen in my wildest dreams. You're you're married. Marriage, there's every book on marriage says it changes you. It changes your relationship to your work. It changes your understanding of the world. Ha, have you experienced that now being being married in, in the industry? and? It doesn't feel like much has changed, although much has like sort of blossomed. I don't know. Like I, I'm thinking about what I said about people don't like to change. Is that super cynical of me? And maybe there's a difference between growing and changing because I think like – People obviously want to grow and have they, have their potential become fruitful, and you know people want to see things grow, but they don't necessarily want to. They aren't eager to just change their ways right away because um, it's scary, right? I think that's what I meant. No, I feel like growth is changes marketing campaign to get people to like change. Like I, because I, I, <laughs> I think you're right. I actually think you're right. Yeah. I, there's a lot of um, really interesting research about how people don't really want new, which is the exact same thing, right? Change new, they're the exact same thing. But yeah. they like the idea of innovation. They like the idea of new wrapped in familiarity. Mm-hmm. And the like yeah. best represents of that in society are sequels, are music that sounds like other music. Yeah. And so that's how we sell things they're like it's like chipotle but it's different we've got queso you know <laughs> it's... yeah 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 so i don't think that's totally. cynical i think it's accurate marriage and all these like big life moments um doesn't feel like maybe it's because it's just like so right it feels like right and awesome and right the best decision ever it doesn't feel like i've changed much because it's like you know it's everything that I want and I've like manifested and have spent my life seeking. So it feels right, actually. Right. That's amazing. That's so great. That's so encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> it's everything you yeah. want. Just follow your heart, you know? <laughs> Good things will come out of it. That's, that's the moral of the You story. might just get a silhouette in Times Square. <laughs> um, <Hey. laughs> so when did you start um, getting involved in the development process of Hamilton? I remember working on a reading, uh, like a week-long reading, and that was when I met Leslie. And um, well, actually, I had met Leslie a little bit before that because we worked on Smash together. Mm. I met David there. It was the first time working with Lynn and Tommy, and um, working with the public and Andy. It was cool. It was like, but it was only Act Two, so I was like, "This is amazing! What happens in Act One?" <laughs> Um, but I definitely had heard Lynn's performance at the White House when he did um, Alexander Hamilton, the first song, his own like solo version of it uh, for the Obamas. And I remember thinking, wow, that's really cool. And that was like when I was in school. So sh- cut to three, four years later, I'm like, oh, that's going to be a show. <laughs> well, that's amazing. And then jump ahead two years later, and you meet President Obama. Oh, my God. Insane. The world works in really insane ways. I feel so lucky. Hamilton was the only show that pre-sold its entire run before its first preview in the public theater's history. Wow. Did you guys feel that? Or did you know after like a week, like, wow, this is great. People are freaking out about this. Yeah. Well, I, I knew and I didn't know. Huh. I knew that I didn't know. <laughs> Is that, does that make sense? Of course. Like I was like very aware and I made a very conscious decision early on, much, much of because like I had really wonderful people like Renee and um, Tommy Kale and Lynn, you know, people just were like, this is like incredible. Just so you know, why don't you take a moment so just take it all, T- take it all, like be encouraged to take it all in. You know, that was my first Broadway show that I'd ever done. And right. I was like, I was like, okay, so 
this is a big deal and it's not normal, but I want to make sure that I'm taking this all in and not getting caught up in how crazy it all is. <laughs> but also, I do want to just like give in to how crazy it all is and never miss never miss a beat like just take every opportunity to like be a part of this madness i think that like one of the best moments that i had is our first preview um on broadway um tommy kale our director he pulled me aside he was like you should just like take a minute to just like stand on the stage and like take it all in if you haven't yet and i was like oh yeah i should do that and i'm really glad that i did that i I stood on the stage and I was just like, hmm. wow, like this is the most incredible thing I could ever have dreamed of. That's Insane. Amazing. That's so cool. Ridiculous. Like I, sometimes I think that I'm like, oh my gosh, I'll never fully understand everything about it until much later in my life. The Tony goes to Hamilton. You sang in an interview that, you know, Lynn was like, hey, I think I don't have you beatbox. Can you go home and beatbox? Oh, well, yeah, that's definitely one of them. I was just waiting for my opportunity to beatbox because I had been sort of secretly practicing alone in my house. Um, No, it was like, (laughs) it was the best gift ever because... Well, poor Eliza. I mean, she's just got a, she's had a really hard time in her <laughs> life. And um, I don't get to rap in the show. Getting to beatbox was like my small moment, my shining moment that I got to have. Um, but, you know, if I had been terrible at it, I think he would have been like, let's try something else. <laughs> um, or it was just like so, my like effort was just like so... Eliza, because she just doesn't get to do that kind of stuff. So, like, right. I think it worked for the character because, you know, she's tr- this mom who's trying to be, like, really cool for her son and connect with him. So she tries to beatbox with him. Some of the great riffs and runs that you hear in Helpless, that was, like, a collaboration between um, Alex Lackamore and I, where we just spent, like, a 30 minutes just trying to, like, figure out what all of that was. Like I said, like in the beginning, it's all of these people coming together and trying to make something greater than what they could all do by themselves. You know, and that's why it's magical. We have a lot of questions that have come from kids about how doing Hamilton changed your life. It was your first Broadway show. Um, to go back to the idea of change, what was a what was a really big welcome change that Hamilton brought about in your life? It was one of those moments where my uh, my work was supporting my life, and it was also at the same time like the most fulfilling artistic experience that I could ask for. And that so is so often not intertwined in that way. It definitely opened my eyes to a world in which like this could be something I spend my whole life doing. And the sort of fear of, like, oh, gosh, like, am I doing this right? Or, like, will I make it? Will this ha- happen? Like, you know, it felt, like, a little bit more like, okay, like, I'll, I'll have some security, at least for the time being, <laughs> you know, in this world. But but I think ultimately, the like, like the biggest lesson, though, is that, like, it's con- – you're constantly looking for work. So, like, even though it changed so much about my life – um, and like the, the amount of artists that I've gotten to meet and work with, like it changed a lot of that, but it really hasn't changed much in terms of like, you know, the, the sort of weird ups and downs, you know, cause you think like you get to a certain point in this business and you're like, Oh, well, like, great. I won't have to deal with that feeling anymore. And then you come to realize like, Oh, like these feelings exist all the time and they happen over and over and over again. The only thing I need to really change is just to be better and be nicer to myself for having to, like, deal with all of these very hard, complicated feelings. Because it's, like, it's a business that asks you to be extremely confident on one end and then also on the other end extremely humble. And sometimes, like, at the same time. 
So negotiating that and just trying to find like uh, a balance with that is really, I found has to be a really important lesson. Can you remember a measurable difference about being with a Hamilton audience versus other audiences you've been with? Or, or is that a lot in kind of the public's imagination that there's this craze inside that theater, like electric energy? Yeah, I mean, well, it was, it was like, from the, from the beginning, Ed, the excitement just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think, um, you know, after a certain point, like, especially when people knew the music, uh, the pressure was like, high, the pressure got higher and higher because if I forgot the words, then everyone would know. <laughs> <laughs> um, to put it simply, I uh, couldn't hide anymore, is what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> no, but ultimately it felt like we were connected by this thing. Like it didn't feel like here I am to share this thing with you that we've made. And like, I, here's like, I'm presenting you with this thing. It felt like, Oh, this thing exists and we're both taking part in it. Um, and of course, like, I, I think like the energy, especially with young people who no, cause you know, we figured like, uh, you know, people who love hip hop, people who love, history, people who love musicals, okay, they're all going to love this. But then you get into, like, people who don't like musicals, who love it, and kids, like, children, like, tiny, almost baby children, who are coming to the show and, like, love it and are obsessed with the history. So that was also, like, really surprising and wonderful. <laughs> I think that's what everybody appreciates most about Hamilton. People who are in the industry is that it made musical theater cool again to the public. Mm -hmm. um, in a way that Hair did. And few mm -hmm. musicals in between were able to actually make it cool to people like, ah, theater, Hamilton. <laughs> you know, <Okay. laughs> there was just a different yeah. air about it. So, so Amelie, here's a character that in the movie really doesn't, speak that much and when she does it's very soft or it's very specific mm -hmm. we're going to make her sing <laughs> in a Broadway musical um, what were some of the challenges of finding that character and that world with Sam and Pam yeah you sort of like brought it up which was like the, what the quietness of this woman like how does that come out on stage the movie did such a wonderful job with the editing um to really show us like how we're getting into her brain that there's those real moments and then there's moments where we get into her brain so like i think that we sort of wrote that um amelie the staged version as well because what better way to get into someone's brain than through song so it kind of actually felt very right but i know i definitely i related to her hmm. um personally and the sort of very quirky um fantastical things that my brain sometimes does i sort of i liked to indulge in that when i got to be in her shoes so that was fun i i still believe if you like separate what commerce and capitalism tell us about success and what artistry tells us about success that amelie was a massive success that it, it really mm. was a beautiful complete great piece of art and i remember how prince when he was alive saying um, you have to know the difference between a, a flop and a failure. That there are artistic failures <laughs> where you can say, all right, we really didn't know what we were making and we had to open. That stinks. But Amelie was complete. If I knew from the beginning that it was going to be a limited run and we ended five weeks later, I would have been like, great, we did a great job. You know. Right. Same thing with Tumacho. Like, we ended a week earlier than we were going to and I just felt like, oh well, yeah, we really like... I don't have any regrets. I don't feel like I missed out on anything artistically in this experience. But it is sad because, you know, sometimes there's really no rhyme or reason. It's just like the right. way things have turned out. And some things just like don't last. But that's, that's the business. That's just like how it is. Like I said, the dichotomy between 
being very um, humble and also being very confident and also at the same time throwing yourself into this so much so that it becomes like your entire life and then being able to just let it go. Yeah. You're like constantly negotiating these two sides. So. Yes. I, honest, I just enjoy things with like really interesting characters. Yeah. Story, yes. Obviously story is, is great. But I'm just like, I want to know like what makes people tick. So whatever it is, I just like, I, I, I'm, I'm dying to like get into the nitty gritty of what, what makes people who they are. Hmm. Do you know the Enneagram, the personality test? Mm-mm. Oh my gosh. Prepare to be obsessed with something. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so it, it makes an argument that there's like nine personality types. Um, I will go through them in 10 seconds and you'll tell me which one you are. The first is the perfectionist. They're a rule follower. They're very rigid. Mm -hmm. They go into a room and see everything wrong with it. Number two is the helper. They want to serve. That's their identity is they just want to be helpful. Number three is the achiever. They're very image conscious and they want to get things done and they do everything to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. Four is the artist. They're ever in search of their identity. Um, they can be really distant and aloof and kind of actually difficult to communicate with, but very expressive. Five is the investigator. They want to get to the bottom of facts. They want to make sure everything is true. They tend to be like historians or really good lawyers. Six is the loyalist. They're kind of wishy-washy. They go into a room looking for the exit sign, but they would like defend their friends, their families, their beliefs like nobody. Then there's seven, life of the party. They're fun, prone to addiction. Um, and like, <laughs> they also don't like being fenced in. Um, like they need, pram they, they need the absence of parameters and they can be spontaneous and unguided. We're almost done. Eight is the, uh, challenger. They see life in black and white. They're that friend that's like, no, you're not wearing that dress. You're wearing this dress. Or no, we're not getting that apartment. We're getting this apartment. Um, also good lawyers. And then number nine is the peacemaker. They, uh, they avoid conflict like the plague, but they're everybody's friend because they just, you know, if you have a problem and you bring it to them, they'll find the peace and the harmony in it. Do you know what you are? Mm. I have a couple guesses. I'm like a very strange combination of helper and challenger. Um, I feel like. Interesting. I wonder if you're a two wing one because a helper that is a perfectionist the challenging part of you probably comes out in the rule follower where you're like, that's not how we do it. This is not, um, that's right. This is wrong. Um, but Oh, maybe, well then maybe I'm not a challenger if it's like that. I, I think of challenging more being like, like, uh, devil's advocating. Like, um, you know what I mean? Like, oh, that, yeah. like oh, I'm, yeah. I'm challenging you right now by being like, well, what if it's not that kind of challenging? <gasps> I wonder if, I wonder if that's the six. <gasps> Are you a six? <laughs> Are you loyal? Are you very, very loyal? To my loved ones? Yeah. I guess everybody is. <laughs> right? Or, well, I guess, Maybe not. Yeah, I guess so. But, like, in terms of, like, the work, I don't think I'm necessarily, like, a loyalist in terms of, like, this is the kind of work that needs to be done. And that's, that's the, like, I'm very open-minded about um, yeah. how things can be done, what kind of things, which, what stories we should be telling. Like, yeah. I'm not, I don't have too many rules in that way. Yeah. You're definitely a two. <laughs> I'm definitely a helper. You, yeah, you're definitely a helper. That's wonderful. Everybody loves helpers, though. That's the thing. Whoever likes to have I'm the most excited. fun. Is that a helper? Like that. That's a seven. Life of the party. Like if if I if I was like, let's go to a bar, you'd be like, I am down. No, right. I'm totally down. But I'm also the person who's like, are we canceling plans? Amazing. I'm <laughs> stay home, and I'm gonna put on my pajamas. <laughs> like that kind of like life of my own party. Yes, I think you totally. definitely are. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're a seven. You're all over the place. She's complex. I'm everywhere. She's, oh, she's, she's all the numbers. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I think Steven is a three. I think he's more like that. Yeah. And and definitely loyal. Definitely a loyal person. When he makes really great friends and has these great collaborators, like he's always working with them. Because he's so great. <laughs> he's so great. <laughs> that's awesome it's a great thing to say about your partner what was it like working with Pam McKinnon I know Pam McKinnon from years gone by but she's amazing 
She's amazing. I loved working with her in Amelie, and I loved working with her in The Parisian Woman. She's just really good at letting actors do the things that they do the best, and at the same time, like, really coming in at the opportune moment and guiding and helping us through sticky spots. I just love her energy. I love who she is in the room. I love her sense of play that she has. I love her curiosity that she has. Um, in a lot of ways, when we were doing Amelie, I was, I was like very much inspired by her curiosity and her, you know, when I would see her brain working, um, I was like, ooh, that's like a very Amelie thing to do. We, we crushed it. We crushed it. And we found out you were an Enneagram too. That's hey. really why we did this. <laughs> That's why we did it. That's why. I gotta say, um, look it up. It's gonna freak. So they they have all of this academic research on. If you can find out what Stevens is, there's all this literature on like when a two and a three are at their healthiest, and it'll say things like when a two finds all of the like elevating ways to help a three, and a three finds all the achieving ways to like empower a two, and it it, it just spells all that out, and it's like here's where you guys can get into tension, or here's. Uh, a problematic area and here's how you solve it and it really has oh. i'm pretty for a long time i've been agnostic to personality tests but this one just blew me away and it changes how i look at plays as a director oh wow and okay. it's yeah i think yeah yeah <laughs> i sound like an I evangelist wait. i love that kind of stuff i mean i'm, I'm like i'm into astrology I'm yes into all of those things that like give you i'm into some tarot just some like little bits of insight for yourself it's You're nice. down to play. I love that. You're like, yes. hey, try it on me. <laughs> I'm a helper. What can I say? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have Thank a great you. Day. Stay safe and healthy during all yes. this craziness. You as well. And uh, I hope that you, um, I hope that this all turns out great and I hope they get something out of it.